On Sunday, March 31st, 1968, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. preached to the congregation at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. He called his sermon, Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution. Dr. King gave hundreds of sermons in his role as a Baptist minister. But this was to be his final homily, the last time he rose to preach to a Sunday morning church service. The title of my lecture is Five Revolutions, and I dedicate it to the memory of Dr. King and in honor of the life and work of Reverend James Lawson. The central trope of Dr. King's National Cathedral homily is the cautionary tale of Rip Van Winkle, the protagonist of a classic American short story published in 1819 by Washington Irving, a major literary figure in the early years of the New Republic. You may be familiar with Irving's story, even if you didn't know who wrote it, because it's achieved a kind of mythic status and become a universal fable. You may remember the character, Rip Van Winkle, as a kind but extremely lazy man who years before had come from Holland to settle in rural New York near the Hudson River. One day, Van Winkle wandered alone from his village up to the Catskill Mountains with his favorite shotgun and his loyal dog. He sat down and fell asleep. When he woke up, he rubbed his eyes. He looked for his musket, but only found an old gun, broken down and rotten. He can't find his dog anywhere. He rubs his face. In astonishment, he realizes that he's grown a long, grizzled beard. He finds his way back to the village and doesn't recognize anyone. What's going on? The answer is shocking. Somehow, Rip Van Winkle has slept for more than 20 years. Well, this is an amusing old tale, but why does it interest Dr. King? He focuses on part of the story that is, quote, almost completely overlooked the portrait hanging in the village pub. In the days before Van Winkle went up to the mountain, he would drink beer beneath a picture of King George III of England in his majestic red robes. But 20 years later, the picture of King George had been taken down and replaced by another, a portrait of a distinguished looking stranger wearing a blue general's uniform with the name George Washington engraved beneath. Who's this man? Of course, Washington was the general of the American forces in the Revolutionary War and the first president of the United States of America. And this is where King finds the theme of his sermon. Not merely that Rip slept 20 years, King said, but that he slept through a revolution. While he was peacefully snoring up in the mountain, a revolution was taking place that at points would change the course of history and Rip knew nothing about it. He was asleep. Yes, he slept through a revolution. Here, Dr. King draws his key message for his parishioners, a lesson for the present day. One of the great liabilities, he said, of life is that all too many people find themselves living amidst a great period of social change, and yet they fail to develop the new attitudes, the new mental responses that the new situation demands. They end up sleeping through a revolution. Remember that King is speaking in the spring of 1968, nearly 50 years ago. What is the current ongoing revolution to which he refers? In a sense, King says, it's a triple revolution. That is, a technological revolution with the impact of automation and cybernation. That's King's word. Then there's a revolution in weaponry with the emergence of atomic and nuclear weapons of warfare. And then there's a human rights revolution with the freedom explosion that's taking place all over the world. Wake up, King is saying. A great revolution is taking place around you right now. Are you gonna sleep through it or are you gonna engage in history? What side will you be on? And what action will you take? Four days later, on Thursday, April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. Why had King come to Memphis? 
he'd accepted an invitation from his close friend, Reverend James Lawson, to join forces with sanitation workers in that city who had risen up to protest against poverty wages and unsafe life-threatening working conditions. Here is Lawson and King at a press conference about the strike. And here is Lawson joining King for a meeting in room 306 of the Lorraine Motel on Wednesday, April 3rd. That night, the last of his life, Dr. King spoke to an overflowing crowd at the Bishop Charles Mason Temple to rally support for the strikers. Why had King come to Memphis, especially when the situation was so dangerous and he had so many other priority demands on him as a pastor, a national figure? King explained, the question is not, if I stop to help this man in need, what will happen to me? Rather, if I do not stop, to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them? That is the question. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed the following day on this same balcony. The Lorraine Motel is now the site of the National Civil Rights Museum, powerful memorial and heritage site. And I urge you to go there if you ever have a chance to visit Memphis or anywhere in the region. Earlier this year, I attended a talk by the same James Lawson at a conference at UCLA. At 86 years old, Reverend Lawson is one of the most powerful and inspiring speakers I've ever heard. In his remarks, he echoed and extended Dr. King's theme of moral, social, and political revolution. I was struck by something very unusual, and I think very powerful that he said, suggesting a new way of thinking about this country and our own political lives. Students throughout the United States study in American history the American Revolution in middle school and often in high school. But if we look carefully at the sweep of American history he observed, we clearly recognize two American revolutions. What did Reverend Lawson mean? Well, the first American Revolution is familiar to us. It's the one Rip Van Winkle slept through, the Revolutionary War against English colonial rule. George Washington's army was victorious, thus his famous portrait replaced that of King George III in Van Winkle's village pub. This revolution, achieved through military combat, was a political revolution, throwing off a colonial master and establishing a new independent nation. The American Revolution also harnessed a tremendous moral force, eloquently articulated by Thomas Jefferson and the nation's founding fathers in the opening paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration proclaimed to the world that the new American Republic would be founded upon radical, uncompromising principles of democracy, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The sole purpose of democratic government is to secure these rights. Thus, the just powers of government are derived exclusively from the consent of the governed. These are fundamental principles, not only of national independence, but a human rights revolution. Martin Luther King often argued that the promises of the Declaration of Independence were the initial spark of the human rights revolution of modern democratic civilization. Promises which the black freedom struggle in the United States vowed to realize and fulfill in the present day. Tragically, however, the first American Revolution was founded on a historic compromise built into the new U.S. Constitution to permit the former slaveholding colonies of the South to become slaveholding states in the new republic. Without this compromise, the framers believed it would be impossible to forge a single unified nation from all the British colonies. Of course, compromises are necessary in political life. This, however, was a morally rotten compromise, a worm in the apple, a radical evil in the founding architecture of the new republic that fatally corrupted its claim to democracy and human rights.
What do I mean by the term rotten compromise and radical evil? Here I refer specifically to the Israeli philosopher Avishai Margalit. For Margalit, a rotten compromise is an agreement that establishes or maintains an inhuman political order based on systematic cruelty and humiliation as its permanent features. Usually the party that suffers the cruelty and humiliation is not a party to the agreement. By humiliation, I mean dehumanization, treating humans as non-humans. By cruelty, I mean a pattern of behavior that willfully causes pain and distress. A rotten compromise that establishes or maintains an inhuman regime of cruelty and humiliation is an assault on morality itself. And that is what makes it radically evil. The compromise made to forge a unified nation, a more perfect union of all former American colonies, North and South, was a rotten compromise because it maintained and codified into law a brutal, inhumane, totalitarian system of white supremacy based on the enslavement of African Americans. It was rotten and it proved short-lived. As the new nation expanded its territorial boundaries westward, conflict renewed between the slave states and the free states regarding the status of the new territories. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 kept the Union together for three more decades, but it too was a rotten compromise, empowering southern slave owners to capture and retrieve former slaves who had escaped to freedom in the northern states. The North tried to buy peace, or at least to purchase breathing room to resolve tensions with the South, without descending into bloodshed. But such a corrupt and cynical deal, born of desperation and moral bankruptcy, could not hold. In February 1861, seven southern slave-holding states seceded from the Union, declaring themselves the Confederate States of America under the presidency of Jefferson Davis. Two months later, Confederate soldiers attacked the U.S. garrison at Fort Sumter, South Carolina, launching a vicious, bloody civil war. During the next four years, the combined deaths of soldiers and civilians totaled over a million souls. Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation by executive order on January 1, 1863, freeing the slaves who were living in the states in rebellion and enabling them to join the Union forces as free men. Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox on April 9, 1865. Before Christmas of that year, the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution abolishing slavery was adopted, having been ratified by the required number of states. Following the war, Reconstruction involved a comprehensive military occupation by the U.S. Army of former Confederate states during which former slaves exercised civil and human rights for the first time in American history. The Union victory in the Civil War and the subsequent Reconstruction period in the Southern states brought momentous change to this country. But these events, however earth-shaking, do not correspond to the second American Revolution of Reverend Lawson's analysis. Why not? because the abrupt abandonment of the Reconstruction Project and the horrific period of reaction and retrenchment that followed effectively erased nearly all of the gains that African Americans had achieved. In retrospect, Reconstruction was a relatively brief transitional period terminated by the Compromise of 1877, which removed federal troops from the South. After all the bloodshed of the Civil War, Again, U.S. politicians agreed to a rotten compromise, choosing appeasement and retrenchment over justice. The end of Reconstruction effectively condemned African Americans in the former Confederacy to re-enslavement under new forms of coercion for decades to come. Throughout the South, blacks were coerced into indentured servitude and forced labor by white plantation owners, by corporations such as U.S. sugarcane, and by race-based prison industrial systems. State legislatures codified white supremacy into a legal system of racial separation enforced by state and municipal authorities, a system known informally as Jim Crow. Meanwhile, violations of forced subservience were handled through extrajudicial means, including lynching 
carried out by racist terror organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. Following World War II, the system of indentured servitude and related forms of coerced labor ended. Still, black soldiers from southern states who fought in World War II against racist regimes in Germany and Japan came home to an entrenched system of racist laws depriving African Americans of equal access to integrated facilities and services, with police forces either affiliated with the Klan or subject to the understanding that it's necessary to look the other way when vigilante justice was imposed against black people. The first signal of hope and change came in 1954 and 1955 from the Supreme Court's landmark decisions in Brown v. Board of Education. The Brown Court declared that laws requiring racial segregation of public schools violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, which provides, no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. I describe the decision as a signal of hope and change, a signal rather than a consummation, because in issuing the Brown decisions, the Supreme Court did not achieve its announced goal to end legally enforced racial segregation in public education and other public facilities with all deliberate speed. On the contrary, in the immediate wake of the Brown decision, the system of white supremacy and Jim Crow segregation became even more firmly entrenched. Southern politicians and officials openly declared their unified policy of massive resistance to the Supreme Court's orders, which they labeled tyranny. At this point, I've set the backdrop for a thought experiment that I would like to share with you. Imagine being a citizen of a city in the Deep South in 1955, the year following the announcement of the first Brown decision. Birmingham, Alabama, for example, or Albany, Georgia, or Jackson, Mississippi. Imagine yourself white or black, for purposes of our exercise in imagination, it doesn't matter. Either way, you're living in a society in which African American parents are required by law to send their sons and daughters to a school for colored children only, and prohibited by law to send their children to a school reserved for whites only. Public school facilities, educational materials, and financial investment made by the city and state for white students are vastly superior to the facilities and resources provided to black students. Moreover, black high school graduates are prohibited by law to attend your state university system. You're living in a state where a wide variety of mechanisms are in place to deprive African Americans of the vote. Poll taxes, literary tests, electoral fraud, restricted registration practices, and overt intimidation. These techniques established in the immediate post-Reconstruction era remain the law of the land in 1955. As a result, only a tiny fraction of black citizens are registered to vote. And white supremacy is the dominant ideology of elected officials at the state and municipal level. State law prohibits African Americans from taking a drink from a whites-only water fountain, from ordering a Coke at a whites-only lunch counter, from sitting at the whites-only waiting room at the bus station or the whites-only section of the front of the bus. Blacks don't violate segregation ordinances because they know the price that will be paid. And the entire system is enforced by police brutality and racist terror. Everyone understands that whoever attempts to openly define the white male power structure will be subject to extrajudicial violence whether in the form of KKK cross-burning, beatings, or murder. As a result, black communities are largely silent and acquiescent in the face of racist oppression and structural violence, not because they accept this system, but because their survival requires it. Imagine then a fine summer day in 1955 in the Deep South. You go by yourself for a hike in a nearby wilderness area, and you sit down in the grass for a little nap. Imagine that, like old Rip Van Winkle, you wake up only to discover that 20 years have passed. Your beard is long and your hair is gray, but the world around you is unrecognizable. 
Laws that had been in place for generations, mandating racial segregation in schools, restaurants, trains, accommodations, public and private facilities alike, they're all gone. All the old signs, whites only, colored only, have been taken down. Congress has passed federal civil rights legislation that has declared them illegal, that guarantees access by all citizens, regardless of race, and that prohibits and punishes acts of racial discrimination. Poll taxes, literary tests, all of the mechanisms utilized since Reconstruction to keep black citizens from voting, all of these have been eliminated. Moreover, Congress has passed federal voting rights legislation that ensures federal intervention to secure equal access to voter registration by all citizens and protects the voting rights of minorities. As a result, black voter registration is incomparably larger than it was when you went to sleep. De facto segregation in housing and education remains in place. Unemployment and poverty remain much higher in black neighborhoods, and many vestiges of racism persist. Remarkably, however, the entire legal and enforcement structure of Jim Crow segregation has been dismantled. How can we explain this extraordinary transformation? James Lawson has a name for it, the Second American Revolution. It was brought into being by a vast grassroots movement pushing for radical social change, neighborhood by neighborhood, city by city, pushing for federal intervention from the White House and, when necessary, the National Guard. It was a social justice movement organized within African American communities to expose and reveal the injustices of Jim Crow to the entire nation and to appeal to the moral conscience of all citizens of all races, North and South. It was a movement of the people themselves, organized in churches and community centers, demanding freedom and equality as promised by the Declaration of Independence, and calling for the complete integration of schools, universities, and all public facilities, and private sector businesses as well, restaurants and accommodations. The first American Revolution included acts of nonviolent civil disobedience, too, most famously in the Boston Tea Party in the period of dissent and escalating tension before armed conflict broke out. But the movement that threw out King George was primarily violent. After all, we call it the Revolutionary War. And its leader, General Washington, was the military commander whose troops successfully defeated the British forces. In contrast, the Second American Revolution was fought by a nonviolent protest movement made up of community volunteers, parents and students, and clergy, with a core of highly disciplined young activists trained and organized in the philosophy and tactics of nonviolent direct action. Its methods were sit-ins and pray-ins, economic boycotts, protest marches, mass demonstrations, and freedom songs. It was a nonviolent revolution, but there were many casualties. Thousands of protesters suffered countless nights in oppressive jails. Hundreds of activists were beaten with fists, sticks, bats, clubs, and weapons of all kinds. Historic black churches where mass meetings took place to plan protests and galvanize moral support for the struggle were burned and bombed. And there were many martyrs, including children and students. The nonviolent army of the black freedom struggle showed the nation and the world that the capacity to endure suffering and to love even those who oppress you is stronger than the forces of hate, racism, and segregation. This is the Second American Revolution. The most famous leader and spokesman for the nonviolent social justice movement was the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. Dr. King galvanized the movement. Time after time, he brought community and municipal struggles to the national media, thus triggering pressure required to end local injustices. But it's essential to remember that the Second American Revolution was carried out by many leaders, many hundreds of activists, and many thousands of supporters. 
Among the most important, influential, and courageous leaders was James Lawson. It was Reverend Lawson who brought the principles of Mahatma Gandhi to the African-American freedom struggle. Lawson had been a Methodist missionary in India for three years, returned as the deeply committed student and practitioner of Gandhian nonviolence, Satyagraha, soul force. Dr. King called him the greatest teacher of nonviolence in America. Indeed, it was Reverend Lawson who taught hundreds of volunteers the philosophy and methods of Gandhian nonviolence and trained them how to respond to violence and brutality with compassion and love. Lawson's students included some of the most important young leaders of the revolution, John Lewis, Diane Nash, James Bevel, and so many others. For Lawson and for countless young activists he trained, nonviolence was more than a tactic, even more than a strategy. It was a way of life. This is the second American Revolution. It's achieved powerful, transformative victories. But it remains incomplete. There's tremendous work still to do. In the spirit of Dr. King, Reverend Lawson, and countless other heroes and martyrs of the civil rights era. This is the second revolution. But the title of my lecture today refers to five revolutions, not just two. What are the remaining three? Remember that Dr. King's National Cathedral sermon was given in the spring of 1968, after Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and after Congress passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, after the two greatest achievements of the black freedom struggle of the 1950s and 1960s. But he spoke about a triple revolution unfolding in the present time. How prescient he was decades before the internet the iPhone and digital robotics to highlight the revolutionary impact of technological change in our lives, especially in the domains he called automation and cybernation. How prescient he was to highlight the revolutionary nature of the threat posed to the human race by thermonuclear weapons. Our awareness of this threat diminished with the end of the Cold War, but we are sleeping like Rip Van Winkle if we ignore the ongoing risks of nuclear catastrophe, proliferation, and terrorism. And how powerful is Dr. King's call to shift thinking from a domestic civil rights framework to an international human rights revolution, a revolution that will unfold or implode depending on how we act to protect and secure freedom and equality throughout the world. Remember that Dr. King asked us to remain awake through a great revolution. What does this mean in the present time? In the National Cathedral, King explained, we all must learn to live together as brothers or we will all perish together as fools. We are tied together in the single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. What is our task under these circumstances, our moral responsibility? For King and Lawson, our responsibility as human beings is to join the powerful nonviolent struggle against racism, poverty, and militarism in the United States and throughout the world. Here are King's words from the National Cathedral. The hour has come for everybody, for all institutions of the public sector and the private sector, to work to get rid of racism. We must come to see that the roots of racism are very deep in our country. And there must be something positive and massive in order to get rid of all the effects of racism and the tragedies of racial injustice. We are challenged to rid our nation and the world of poverty, and we must find an alternative to war and bloodshed. And here are Reverend Lawson's words from the recent UCLA conference I had the privilege to attend. The intellectual world and the world of religion must somehow unite to spark another movement in Western civilization that will be essentially a movement on behalf of all of the innocent of the world. Above all, it will become a nonviolent direct action movement that will stir and transform our nation and the world. Thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you today.